we have about 20 to 25,000 genes in each cell. If the gene stops working, the risk of the cell turning into a cancer cell then becomes higher. So there are those groups which have uh, high risk factors. We do also encourage them to go for genetic testing. I'm delighted to be chatting today with genetics counsellor Suki and clinical oncologist Dr. Jennifer Leong about genetics testing. Suki, how is a gene test actually carried out? Well, the particular genetic test that we're talking about today, when, when we mentioned BRCA1 and BRCA2 and the Angelina Jolie story, it is mm-hmm. about an inherited uh, risk. So whether someone actually has an increased risk that they're born with. So this sort of genetic test, we usually will use a blood or a saliva sample. The genes are removed from the sample and it is almost like a spell check. You look through the gene to see if there are any genetic changes that we might suspect to cause the gene to stop working. Then we will be able to find the faulty parts of the gene. So what the genetic test does is not to look for a gene, is to actually right. look for the genetic changes or what we call variants in these genes. And then mm. we can try and make an estimation to see then whether these genes have stopped working and that might cause the increased risk in the person. Right, right. I've seen plenty of Facebook ads um, promoting lifestyle uh, gene testing. Is that different from what the, from the gene testing that you're referring to today? Yeah, there, there, there are many types of genetic tests, actually. Lots and lots right. of genetic tests for different reasons. So um, some of the ones that are being marketed directly to consumers, uh, those are more of a screening test. You know, if someone's interested in their ancestry or maybe they're interested in some lifestyle factors and, and so on. Um, but particularly for risk, Um, an understanding of risk and for choice of uh, treatment, for example, then um, we tend to um, go with what are known as uh, established diagnostic tests. So they were able to choose the appropriate genes and Mm -hmm. to ensure that the genetic test has been done in uh, a manner where we are certain of certain, uh, certain reporting and what we can use the result for, which is for a clinical management. So the, the different groups of genetic tests, and it's important to understand the purpose of doing the genetic test. I see. So if I hear you right, that means the, gene- the g- genetic test that you'd run in hospitals um, has a certain standard of reporting or um, a testing that's different from what we are seeing that's marketed direct to consumers online. Yes. Uh, yes, in, in a nutshell, yes. And also um, the what is targeted in each gene and technique behind um, the understanding of the information that's generated from the genetic test. So uh, if it's for a, what we like um, for a diagnostic purposes, if it's for clinical management, then it needs to be done in a certain way. I see. That, that's very insightful. So I suppose um, if I could say the, the, the patient would normally come in first to see the oncologist, someone like yourself, Dr. Jennifer, and then you would do that risk assessment. Mm-hmm. And, and, and how does that whole process work and where does Suki sort of come into that journey? Yeah. So we work very closely with Suki and her team. So essentially, what we're trying to adopt as oncologists is to you know mainstream it. So we will be the initial person who um, open up the idea of genetic testing to patients. Because I think first and foremost, patient has already formed a bond with us and uh, the trust is there. So they sort of look to us for advice. So when we encourage them and we select the patient who goes for genetic testing, um, we sort of preempt them what what is the purpose of doing this genetic testing? Do they add value to their treatment? And I think very important is also to explain to them the potential implications to their family members. So a lot of them are doing it not just for themselves, but say for their children. So it's important for them to understand when the result comes back, you know, how it can impact their family members or their siblings. So Mm -hmm. we sort of do sort of like a pre-genetic counseling, and then we refer them to a professional like Soki to then take on the, the role before they do the test. And there's also a post-test counselling when the results come out that they will right. follow up with. 
And Suki, would you like to walk us through a little bit what it's like for the patient when they come and see you? Yep. So because the general understanding about genetics in uh, the general population at the moment in Malaysia is still not quite where it's supposed to be. So for most people, when they hear of genetic testing, mm-hmm. there is, um, it's a very new thing. So it takes a, a, a few discussions in order to get the message across. So it's great to have their primary caregivers who will be the oncologist like Dr. Jennifer, to prime it first and to talk about it. Then when they come and see us, we will reiterate some of the um, discussions that we had, but more of actually helping them to understand some of the other uh, implications and also the whole logistical pathway on what needs to be done. Right, So we spend time with them saying, this is what you're supposed to do next. This is how we do the sampling. This is mm-hmm. what a report may look like. These are some of the reports that you may see, what can be in it, what is to be expected in the report. Also, very importantly, it's to manage the expectations. So um, mm-hmm. the genetic test does not answer all of the questions. And right. as cancer patients, they have many different, um, you know, aspects that they want answers for. Sure. And the genetic testing answers some of it, may or may not even. Um, mm-hmm. And that's important to, to help them work through what the expectations should be. And right. with the post-test counselling, if there is something found in particular, or if there's a variant that's not so well understood, we need to... Um, help them understand the report well so that a, uh, the decision when it comes to, say, treatment, treatment. Mm-hmm. or even um, what to do next in terms of yep. risk management. Like you have said earlier in the talk, you know, is it going to be a prophylactic surgery? Is it screening? Then all of those will be um, discussed in detail. And in addition, we try to support them as much as we can. The psychosocial support is something we find that is um, necessary at this mm. point in time. Because when we are talking about this particular genetic testing and inherited risk, sometimes yes. some patients get a little bit concerned. We are involving family members mm-hmm. uh, and every family is different. Every person is different. Not everybody may want to know what mm. their risks are going to be. You know, It may cause additional stress. So some of these are information that we need to um, try and put across as gently as possible and to, to give the opportunity for the patients to, um, to bring up their concerns and to answer them if we can. I think the biggest misnomer is that um, someone with family history should be the one that's just tested, those are the high-risk group. But even someone without a family history People, if you're listening to this on Spotify or watching on YouTube, share with us any of your experience that you've had with gene testing. We want to hear from you and we hope that together we can create a community that shares the health journey experience right here at Talk Health Asia. I'm Pauline Lim. See you again next time. Bye for now.